right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. And uh, welcome to our first meeting back from summer break. We hope you had a great uh, summertime and got out there and got to see some native plants on your uh, adventures and hikes. My name is Gina Bono, and I'm a volunteer with the Portland chapter of the Native Plant Society of Oregon. NPSO promotes the enjoyment, knowledge, and protection of Oregon's native plants. I'd like to especially welcome any of our new members tonight. As part of our mission, we present a speaker each month on timely topics of botanical interest. Tonight, our speaker is photographer Don Jacobson, and we will get to his presentation shortly. First, let's review some Zoom etiquette. Please leave your audio and video turned off during the program. After the presentation, we will have time to unmute and turn our cameras on. This is a great time for everyone to connect with each other virtually. Um, if you have a question during the program, you can click the chat button at the bottom of your screen to type it into the chat box. Don will address questions after the slideshow. We've also added a closed captioning feature. You can click live transcript to enable that feature. Looking ahead to October 13th, our virtual program will be with Ryan O'Hario of the Washington, Washington Trails Association. Um, his talk is titled Building and Stewarding Trails for People, Plants, and Posterity. So please register for that through our quarterly uh, Calicordis publication or through our meetup page. Um, currently, we are seeking nominees for our February board members election. If you are interested in being president, field trip coordinator, newsletter editor, communications coordinator, web editor, or treasurer, please contact us at npsopdxchapter at gmail.com. That's npsopdxchapter at gmail.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you if you're interested. Uh, lastly, if you are looking for some native plant starts, you can visit the um, Portland, State, uh, Portland State University Farmers Market this fall, where the Berry Seed Bank will have plants available for donation, as well as horticultural advice. For more information, you can read about it in the Calicordis or follow the Seed Bank, seed bank on Instagram at berry underscore seed underscore bank. And with that, I will turn it over to our Portland chapter vice president, Gabriel Campbell, who will be introducing our speaker. Welcome, Gabriel. Thanks, Gina. <clears throat> it's my honor to introduce this evening's speaker, Don Jacobson. <clears throat> Don is a former electrical engineer and glassblower who turned photography as a creative outlet. As a decades long member of the Portland chapter, he has always shared his passion for capturing the light and beauty of native plants and their natural habitats using special effects he's developed over the years. He has been awarded first prizes in numerous professional photo contests, been featured on covers of magazines and has contributed to wall calendars for the Sierra Club engagement calendar during 2021 and 2023 and the Port Portland Japanese Garden. His photos have been published in at least five books. Additionally, Don was the Portland chapter president of the Native Plant Society of Oregon, founded the Calicordis newsletter, and hosts the radio show, Moving On, which is broadcasted on KBU. Welcome, Don. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to show my photographs of our native flora to the uh, Native Plant Society. Um, I'd like to, to uh, uh, start off by uh, uh, saying that uh, the uh, photographs that um, you are, are going to see are not necessarily for identification. They're the, the concept of my photography is to show the beauty of our native flora. And uh, I will say that uh, uh, no wildflowers were uh, damaged in the course of my uh, photography. Um, I uh, will apologize right off the bat for any misspellings and uh, uh, typos. And uh, 
you can uh, feel free to uh, email me uh, corrections. However, if I have a misidentification, um, you should uh, s speak up, unmute yourself and let me know that, that, uh, that I have misidentified a plant. A little bit about myself. I have a, a degree in electrical engineering. I was a glass blower for 30 years. And um, when I was an engineer, my colleagues um, gave me a copy of Consumer Report that rated various top end cameras. And um, I picked up a Pentax Spotmatic. Some of you may uh, know about that camera. Great uh, single lens reflex with a, a 1.4 lens. And I took a class through the UCLA Extension, and I was very fortunate that it was taught by Edmund Teske, who was uh, very well known in the Los Angeles area in the fine arts field. And it showed me that photography could be more than just documentation. And uh, he's been uh, an inspiration uh, to me, although I don't do the same kind of work that he did. Um, in, I started uh, printing my slides by scanning them and then putting them into Photoshop. And I found that I had much greater creative control that way. And I went fully digital in 2004. And uh, again, my work took a big jump at that point. And I had the opportunity to compare some of my black and white photographs that I had printed in the wet dark room with those that were printed digitally. And um, the ones that I printed digitally were far superior to the uh, dark room work. And uh, I've uh, never looked back since then. I've made uh, 12 trips to Iron Mountain and Cone Peak since uh, 2005. And I've gone every year since 2014. And based on the advice of Robert Ross, uh, I've always been there about the 4th of July, which uh, is uh, about the peak season, plus or minus. So uh, this is um, uh, Ross's uh, book. Um, I don't know if it's still available. It may be available um, through the various outlets uh, as a used uh, copy. And um, he has a very uh, extensive plant list. And um, I'd like to uh, read a little bit from the, the book that uh, talks about why it was that the wildflowers of the Western Cascades is based on Iron Mountain. First of all, it's in the middle range of the Cascades and uh, it supports the greatest number of wildflower species because it contains nearly all of the habitats typical of the Western Cascades. This mountain hosts more than 300 species, excluding grasses, sedges, and rushes. And it also has a very moderate environment with 70 plus inches of rainfall. And uh, Iron Mountain is not just a plain that was pushed up, it was created by volcanic activity. About 30 million years ago, the site was occupied by a volcano that was probably near the shore of a shallow sea. And then 30 to 20 million years ago, there were various volcanic eruptions that uh, built up a series of peaks in the area. The landscape has changed so much in the last 20 million years that the geologic story of the Western Cascades has been obscured by more recent activity. About 13 million years ago, the Western Cascades began to be uh, uplifted 
eventually blocking moisture, creating uh, desert in, in uh, Eastern Oregon. And uh, most of the original topography has been erased in the last 2 million years. Uh, many ice sheets have uh, come and gone further modifying the original volcanoes that were in the area. The slope of the south face is more vertical because it heats up, then cools, freezes, and thaws, and swells and shrinks, causing large blocks of rock to move slowly downhill or to fall away. The north side, in contrast, erodes at a much slower rate, which allows a thin layer of soil to remain at the higher levels. And there are 18 plant communities found on Iron Mountain and Cone Peak. So for those of you who don't know where Iron Mountain is, here's uh, I-5, Salem, Albany, Lebanon, and uh, we go east about uh, 62 miles from I-5, and uh, here's Iron Mountain and Cone Peak. The uh, typical approach is either here from Highway 20 or, or here. However, I like to use this little spur road, the Highway 35. It's, uh, it accesses Highway 20 at milepost 62. And if you have uh, Sullivan's, William Sullivan's book, he does describe uh, where to find this <clears throat> excuse me, this spur road. So my route takes me up, switching back, switching back, switching back, and switching back, and switching back again to the summit of Iron Mountain, retracing my steps, and then going over to the meadows at Cone Peak. So this is what the uh, Iron Mountain looked like from the uh, trailhead that I used in 2009. And this is what it looks like uh, this year. You can see the firs have uh, grown up considerably since uh, I photographed it in 2009. And I've organized my slides more or less alphabetically, uh, lacking uh, a better creative way to do it. So we'll, we'll uh, get into it. I'll start with um, uh, Yarrow. Uh, the scientific names are, are usually down at the bottom. And if I r remember, I will give the uh, common names. And I just point out that the um, water droplets are natural. And uh, you can always tell when a photographer has sprayed a plant to uh, bring out the water droplets, because when you uh, spray it manually, the water droplets are all the same size. And here you can see they're all different. So uh, I was lucky enough to be up there the morning uh, that the temperature dropped below dew point and uh, created these lovely dew drops. And this is the uh, orange mountain dandelion and allium amplectans, a uh, beautiful genus. Uh, all of the uh, alliums are really lovely. And uh, another, the flat bladed onion. And uh, most of the time around 4th of July, the uh, this particular allium has uh, has dried out, and you're lucky to find some that are in bloom. And another shot of the allium on plectins. The um, service berry in Canada, it's called Saskatoon berry, and they make a really lovely jam from it. The um, Windflower, an anemone. These are what look like petals, are really sepals. 
another view of it. This is um, something like pussy toes in the, in the sunflower family or aster family. And one of my favorites, the columbine, the uh, species name Formosa, I believe means beautiful and it's uh, very well applied. Manzanita, the Sierra Nevada Manzanita. And uh, sandwort. And uh, here you can see it lives up to its name. It's got a whole lot of sand on the petals. Arnica, and this is the genus for, from which a salve is, uh, has been formulated that uh, people use topically. And something that I learned relatively uh, recently is that these ray petals, which are individual flowers, that uh, th these notchings are a th throwback to when they were actually five separate petals and uh, fused together. And here's the uh, disc flowers. And the old common name for the Aster family was compositae or composed of two different kinds of flowers, the uh, disc flower and the ray flower. This is the rayless Arnica, Arnica perii. And sagebrush. And here's what it looks like without the water droplets. Goat speared. And I think that um, it used to be called uh, sty stivesteri. I think this is the new name for it. And wild ginger and wild ginger hides its flowers under a barrel you have to look under the leaves to see it and actually the, the flowers are quite showy but you have to work to find them uh, i'm assuming that because the um, flowers are are hidden from above that it's looking for ground pollinators And uh, this is actually my, uh, my finger. The butterflies like salt. And after working up a good sweat, uh, they decided they would mine my, my finger for some salt. And here's a, another checker spot doing the same thing. And here's one on a leaf. And a Parnassian. And this is uh, the Cone Peak Meadows in 2005, the first year that I went up there. And you can see uh, why I was uh, so impressed and made so many return trips. This is the bark of the Alaska yellow cedar. I wasn't actually able to get a good photograph of the weeping vegetation, but uh, at least I was able to get the bark. I, do, I don't think it's very common in, in the Cascades. And another one of my favorite genuses is the Mariposa lily, Calicordus, uh, and uh, it's why I named the Portland Chapter newsletter the Calicordus when I started it. This is looking from underneath the plant, and then this is looking on top. When you, this gives a, a good description of the lilies in threes and sixes. They're the stigma divided up into threes and three petals and six anthers. Harsh paintbrush, which um, 
I believe is uh, uh, misnamed. Uh, it, there's nothing harsh about this paintbrush at all, at least visually. And here it is uh, mixed with sandwort. And there's a few of the um, common paintbrush, the Miniata, found uh, on uh, high up near the summit of Iron, Iron Mountain. And uh, Ceanothus volutinus or tobacco brush. The Ceanothus species is very good about fixing nitrogen, taking nitrogen from the air and with the help of um, some other uh, flora, it fixes nitrogen. And often you see it uh, coming back after a fire, which is uh, very beneficial because usually after a fire, what little nitrogen is left in the soil is uh, volatilized and uh, the Ceanothus can bring it back unless the Forest Service wants to spray it with herbicides. Field chickweed. And this is the mountain thistle, it's a, it's a native. And I understand that this is uh, not very common. And uh, the small flowered Claytonia. And here it is in mass on one of the slopes on Iron Mountain. And it's uh, sibling, the uh, Siberian candy flower. And this is uh, one of the uh, vertical slopes on the trail up to the summit of Iron Mountain. Another one of my favorites is Queen's Cup or Blue Bead Lily. The, uh, as you might guess from the name, the seed is a bright blue and uh, I still don't have a really good photograph of it. And here's the uh, Claytonia without the uh, water droplets. And um, being in the lily family, it, it's in threes and uh, sixes. The, uh, the petals, which are on top of the sepals, which are below, and here you can see that they are placed below the petal. And the botanists have aggregated the name for, for these and called them tepals. The small flowered uh, blue eyed Mary. And this is the large flowered blue eyed Mary. And when I would lead wildflower identification classes, I would point this out and call it large flowered blue eyed Mary. And people would look at me like I was crazy. You uh, would have to see it uh, up against a small flowered. Colinsia to see that it really is a larger flower. And here it is in mass on uh, the cone in the Cone Peak Meadows. And this was uh, this year on uh, Cone Peak in the Cone Peak Meadows. You can see um, uh, monkey flower. Here's the large flowered blue eyed Mary. Uh, Menzies larkspur, and here's a uh, Raposa lily. And the uh, linear leaf Colomia. Um, I believe I've only seen this one year of all the, all the trips that I've made. I was fortunate to find this one in really good shape. 
And um, I love the, the common name, bastard toad flax. And what's there not to love about bastard toad flax? And it's a, uh, um, a parasite or a semi-parasite. It does have green leaves, but it does parasitize other flora. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here we're looking at Cone Peak up here and uh, uh, could be monkey flower or it could be sedum, I'm not sure. This is a uh, spotted coral root. It's uh, an orchid, a native orchid. And when I first was learning uh, my botany, I thought it was a saprophyte, something that lived on decaying organic matter, but uh, the, the science has now realized it's a mycotrophic living on the, the um, other living decaying, uh, uh, other living uh, flora with an intermediate host. And if you've seen the seed pods of the, the uh, coral oryza, they, they point down. And uh, my thinking is that because the plant grew where there is that association, it gives the seeds a head start. And very often you see um, an aggregation of these plants. Now here's uh, the same plant, but it has a uh, yellow variety. And here it's sort of an intermediate. The, the stem is yellow, and this, but a more typical uh, flower. Uh, this is same plant with a more yellow flower. Another coral oryza, another coral root is the Mertens coral root. There's a, another view of that. It also has a yellow form that uh, I often see on the Umbrella Falls Trail loop. And a bunchberry. And uh, it's a dogwood. And the what look like petals are really bracts, modified leaves. And these are the flowers right here. Another view of it. Very elegant flower. And uh, I think this squeezed in on towards. Here's a, a backlit look of a uh, field of flowers on the slopes of Iron Mountain. This is uh, the uh, heart leafed buckwheat, Gilia capitata, the globe buckwheat, globe uh, lily, uh, Gilia, excuse me. And here's a nice view of the uh, larkspur, Menzies larkspur. And this is from uh, this year. It was an especially good year for larkspur this year. And this is from this year on Cone Peak Meadows. And again, this year, great year for the larkspur and the uh, monkey flower. From 2007. And here we have a bouquet of two deadly flowers, the larkspur, which is um, thought to be a livestock poison and Death Camus, and the, the name says it all. Bleeding hearts, again, Formosa, meaning beautiful, very well named. No, I think they, they used to be in its own family. Now I think it's in a poppy family. And uh, I used to know this one as a potentella or sink foil.
the species uh, around Iron Mountain seem to have uh, um, uh, these white petals. Not real common, but uh, very common around Iron Mountain Cone Peak. And uh, one of the willow herbs. And it's in the evening primrose family. And one of the characteristics of the evening primrose family is that it has an inferior ovary. And that doesn't mean that the inferior isn't as good as others. It means it is below the petals. And actually what looks like a stem here is the, uh, that's the ovary. And this is a uh, daisy. And here's our close up of the heart leafed buckwheat. And it's really pretty with the uh, buds, the sepals covering up the flower, and uh, really a, a lovely display even when the flowers, all the flowers aren't out. And here is the sulfur flowered buckwheat. Again, this one, uh, here is, uh, here's a flower that's out, but these are the, the buds and it makes a really nice display. Uh, I know this one as woolly sunflower, comes from the lenantum meaning woolly. Um, I learned it in California. In Oregon, uh, people call it uh, Oregon sunshine. We'll see. And um, another photograph of flowers along the Iron Mountain Trail. We've got the globe gilia. Um, this is uh, the Oregon sedum, woolly sunflower, heart leaf buckwheat. And it's not all meadows and flowers. It has a, a lovely forest with um, a little fog, gives a great atmosphere. This is uh, between Iron Mountain and the Cone Peak Meadows. Strawberry. And this is on the slopes of Cone Peak. This is uh, Gordon's Ivesia and the Cliff Penstemon and, and Phlox diffusa down here, the diffuse Phlox. We'll see these closer up a little bit later. And this is from uh, 2005, my first year. And, uh, Nice close up of the uh, globe gilia. The uh, rattlesnake orchid uh, usually blooms much later than 4th of July when I'm up there, but uh, you can recognize the plant by its very striking leaves that are variegated along the, the mid, mid vein. And it's lovely in leaf too. Oops, long way. From 2019, got the uh, harsh paintbrush, woolly sunflower, larkspur, and uh, the sink foil. And if you got uh, closer, you'd probably find a couple other species as well. Here's some. Uh, Colinsia, Blue Eyed Mary, Forget Me Not, this is a uh, native. Cow parsnip, and some people um, have a problem with it and it gives them uh, dermatitis. So you might want to try it and see if it works. Uh, this, this is. Um, Hawkweed, this was not taken at Iron Mountain, but I wanted to show the uh, 
the leaves of this plant because it's often very distinctive and can be identified even when it's not in flower, although the, the leaves that I just showed are probably not from the species. Water leaf, there's a couple of species of water leaf. Uh, and this is the uh, one that's less common, at least to me, the Fender's water leaf. And uh, all the dewdrops give it uh, its name. Um, this is Skyrocket. Gilly, uh, um, it used to be in the uh, Gilia genus and uh, now uh, Epimosis. The Phlox family. And this is a view from the summit, looking down at some of the geology. And what looks like uh, sedimentary is uh, a very likely successive volcanic uh, eruptions and deposits. And I'm assuming that the red is from iron. And this was from 2014. I'm not sure if this is still intact. After the presentation, if somebody knows, they can let me know. And looking up at the mountain from the trail to the summit. And this is uh, the Cone Peak Meadows looking back at Iron Mountain. That was from this year. This is a close up of the um, Ivesia. Uh, this is the only place that I've seen this particular plant. If, uh, after the presentation, if people know where uh, they can find it uh, elsewhere in the Cascades, I'd be curious to know. But it's been uh, very uh, consistent where I found it on the slopes of Cone Peak. And this is what the plant looks like. Extremely dry substrate, very rocky, thin soils. And from 2019, it was a great year for the Mariposa lily and paintbrush, larkspur, the buckwheat. And the Sierra Nevada pea. Now, the entire pea family has beautiful, very distinctive flowers. And this is uh, looking from a different perspective, also very attractive. And uh, I've been photographing lichen without knowing what they are uh, ever since I got a, a camera and color film. This, I think, is geographic lichen. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about that. And of course, our beautiful Columbia tiger lily. And the Washington lily. lily. This is found in the Sierra Nevada. And um, where I live near Nevada City, Grass Valley, I would see it on uh, Highway 20 going to uh, Donner Summit. And um, it was right near the town of Washington. So I thought that this beautiful lily was named after the town of Washington. But as it turns out, it's named after Martha Washington. Wild flax, and it has uh, leaves that uh, are very deciduous and uh, much uh, to my uh, chagrin when I tried photographing it and jostled it, a couple of the petals would fall off. Here it is uh, very early in its um, blooming and the, the petals haven't completely flattened out yet. This is the toy blade orchid. Um, it's a native, another native orchid. It's um, 
maybe nothing to uh, write home about, but um, once you key on seeing it, then you realize that there are quite a few of them, but they're so easily overlooked because of the fact that the flower, the plant is small and the flower is green. And this is um, Prairie Star. The name um, Lithophragma I love because it means rock breaker. So apparently the, the person who got the name, the genus had found that this particular plant growing right out of rock and fragmenting it. And um, Martindale's Lomation in the uh, carrot or parsley family. Another pea family, the lotus, the Sierra Nevada lotus. And here's a, a close up of it. And looking at lupin before it's blooming. It's lovely. And here it is in bloom, the wide leafed lupin. And again, a very interesting. And, uh, compelling even when it's in bud. And I believe that this is the Laxophorus covered in uh, water jewels. And this used to be a Smilocena, it's the uh, some people call it false Solomon seal. Um, uh, there's, there's nothing false about it. So I've uh, decided it's Western Solomon seal. And I think that this is fool's huckleberry. Or KCE. This is... Um, Lungwort, I think, is one of the common names, but I know it from California as Langwood Ladies, and it's uh, a great name for these uh, flowers. And uh, the slender phlox, very small flower, easily overlooked. Another easily overlooked flower is the Brewer's uh, Mimulus. And um, I know that uh, most people have changed the uh, genus to Aaron or something like that. But I saw online that a number of scientists said that the name Mimulus uh, is uh, valid and, and the, uh, uh, they don't uh, go along with the name uh, Mimulus. Um, I like Mimulus because one, I can remember it and I know how to spell it. This is a very small plant um, and it's on the uh, trail up to Iron Mountain Summit. And the common uh, monkey flower, Potus. And this is the slimy leafed monkey flower. And um, if you see this uh, monkey flower with the very round corolla, uh, try the leaves and see if you find them slimy. This is. Um, Martyrwort, Brewer's Martyrwort. And again, I think they changed the genus on this one as well. And maybe even, maybe the species. This is uh, another species of Martyrwort. And this is a, a, one of the more showy uh, Martyrworts, the Trifida. And another, uh, this is a Sandwort that used to be Arnaria, I believe. Very small, but if you get close to it, very attractive. And from 2005, along the trail, uh, Mount Jefferson, from the summit, another photo of the wild gardens on Cone Peak Meadows, turtle heads, closely related to penstemons. Uh, another one of my favorite plants is the uh, mountain owl's clover. And 
them from the slopes of Iron Mountain. And the bractated uh, lousewort. And uh, this, the, this has a bunch of different common names. Parrot's bill, I think is one of them. And uh, related, uh, same genus as the, the bracted lousewort. Another photograph of the uh, plant. A close up of the flower. Penstemon, uh, abundant on the slopes of Iron Mountain. And uh, there are a few examples of the Cardwell's Penstemon, if you know where to look. And um, a hot rock Penstemon. This is found in the same area as, the, as Gordon's Ivesia on the slopes of Cone Peak. And this is uh, the summit of Iron Mountain in a good year. And this is a close up of the uh, Cliff Penstemon. It's, uh, there's a, a, a related species in California, Penstemon newberryi, that looks very much like it and grows pretty much in the same kinds of habitat. And another Penstemon, the serrate Penstemon, Facilia, that has um, its flowers arranged in what I love to say a scorpioid sign. It's not real obvious, you'd have to unravel it here, but um, fiddle neck, if you take a look at fiddle neck, that's the stereotypical scorpioid sign. And Phlox diffusa, flowers can vary from uh, milk white to pink to purple. Another uh, inconspicuous orchid. And another one of my favorites, uh, found in, in great abundance around Iron Mountain and Cone Peak, is uh, Jacob's Ladder, the peach-colored Jacob's Ladder. Um, there's uh, a couple of plants near Angel's Rest. And if you're lucky, you um, can find it at the right time of the year. This has been pretty um, reliable around the 4th of July on Cone Peak Iron Mountain. And the alpine knotweed. Fairy bell, Hooker's fairy bell. And uh, white veined wintergreen. And uh, here's uh, how it got its name. This this was not photographed on Iron Mountain, but I thought I'd throw it in there to uh, show you how it got its name. And from 2020, uh, uh, another great garden of buckwheat, sedum, gilia, woolly sunflower, paintbrush, uh, delphinium, larkspur. This is um, it used to be a Luina. Now it's Rhaenyraria stricta in the aster family. Uh, it's usually not in bloom. I believe this, but I did photograph it um, near the trailhead. Uh, this was not photographed at Iron Mountain, but um, it was either in Mount Rainier or perhaps the uh, Umbrella Falls Trail. Just to give you a sense of what it looks like. Uh, and uh, Romeria, a uh, mushroom. And uh, our, our rhododendron. This one was not photographed on the trail, but on the uh, spur road from Highway 20 to the trailhead. And sticky gooseberry. 
And here it is without the bug. And um, the naked seed rose, wild rose. And uh, thimbleberry. And uh, this uh, obviously was named by somebody who uh, was asleep during Latin class because a parva flora means small flowered. And uh, compared to most flowers, wildflowers, uh, the flower of thimbleberry is huge. But the name persists. <clears throat> Another wild garden. And uh, there are several saxifrages on Iron Mountain. And growing on the vertical cliff. And this is the rusty saxifrage. And the entire leafed saxifrage. And this is the Western saxifrage, and it's pretty much on its way out, but I managed to get it while there, there was still color in the petals. But you can see the ovaries are really swollen with seed because it's one of the early blooming saxifrages. And there are lots of sedum. This is, this is the worm-leafed sedum. The Oregon sedum. Nice close up. Well, I forgot to put the name. This is. Um, uh, Stenopepalum, Sedum Stenopepalum, are rarely in bloom at the time I usually visit. Uh, here's, here's one that, that I managed to get in bloom. And the triangle leafed Senecio. And uh, here we see why it's called triangle leafed. Very distinctive. The uh, Douglas's catch fly, Douglas, a early Scottish botanist who did a lot of work on the West Coast. There's a fabulous biography of him called The Collector. And the author uh, is um, Nesbitt, I believe. And it's a really interesting reading. I recommend it. Well, Douglas did uh, just fabulous work. Uh, very early on. And um, the uh, elderberry leaf. And this is uh, the rosy twisted stalk. This one was not photographed at uh, Iron Mountain, but it uh, shows the, the flower. It's a very small flower, and you have to get underneath it and look up to see it. This, this was photographed in um, Iron Mountain. And a, uh, probably an anise swallowtail on Larkspur. And from Cone Peak Meadow, Meadows 2020. And French cup, fairly common in the Cascades. You see that when it ages, it starts turning pink, pinkish. Well, this is taken from, this is the three sisters taken from the summit in uh, 2021. And you can see the air quality was uh, left something to be desired. Fortunately, uh, this year it was much, much better. 
foam flower, very delicate flower. It's uh, very small. It pays to get close to it. And uh, this is called Youth on Age because the new leaves grow on the axles of the old one, which I don't have a picture of. I just have the flowers, but very distinctive flowers. And uh, Death Camus it used to be Zygodaneus. This is what uh, the trail looked like in 2019 between Cone Peak and Iron Mountain. Then right along the trail. Pacific star flower. I had a friend in California who says, you can remember the scientific name because it's trying to tell us something. Probably that it has a wide leaf. And here's another really special plant that I find. So far, I've only found it uh, on the Iron uh, Mountain Cone Peak Trail. Um, I, I've seen it in California, but this is the only place in Oregon that I've, I've seen it. It's a really unusual clover. And uh, it's looking from underneath. And this is looking from the top. And this one looks like a Prussian helmet. Um, usually trilliums are really pretty far gone by the time I get to Iron Peak, but I did find one that was still hanging in there and it's really uh, beautiful in its age. And somebody uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at least in the Pacific Northwest, when the cones are growing upright, it's a true fir. And another garden uh, with the uh, columbines, scarlet gilia, larkspur, another great backlit garden. And this is um, Sitka valerian. It's a plant that uh, Valium was originally synthesized from. So if you're hiking along the trail and you're nervous, you might want to chew on the leaves if you're good at identification. And the uh, yellow violet, the common violet. And uh, you know, it seems to me that most of the violets are yellow so they should have been called yellows, and then the violet one can be called a violet yellow, but nobody listens to me. Now, when I first saw this red on the uh, vine maple, I thought that it was a, a fungus, but I later found out it is a, a wasp gall, that a wasp has uh, laid its eggs on the plant, and the plant has uh, responded by building up the structure around it. And uh, then dew point, if you can get there, uh, it's just really, really lovely. You'll find uh, the vegetation with these lovely water drops by the uh, midday, you come back down and they're all gone. Well, this was this year, Cone Peak Meadows, And this is the uh, uh, the trail at the, at, at the beginning of the trail. I, I don't know if you can see it in here, but there's a, a, a post right there that um, lets you know that that's the trailhead. Great. Uh, this was a great year for bear grass, as you can see. And a little more detail of the bear grass. And then uh, this was taken along the road between Highway 20 and 
the trailhead. So we'll go back here. So I'll be glad to take questions. Well, we didn't have too many come in the chat box, but I hope that we will have direct questions to you. Uh, Paul did say that the Ivesia uh, Gordoni is also on Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. Oh, so okay. that may make sense. Right, good. Oh, I might um, add, I forgot to, to mention that next year I will be giving a class in photographing wildflowers in the field. It will be uh, get, uh, sponsored by the Oregon Society of Artists in July. And uh, you, if you send me an, an email, I'll be glad to put you on my mailing list and uh, let you know all the details about that. It's uh, going to be something like um, July 7th, 8th, and 9th. There'll be um, uh, uh, an evening lecture, a day in the field, and then uh, a half a day of critique of the work that we did in the field. Also, if you'd like to be on my mailing list, uh, send me an email. And uh, I have lots of things on my, my website. Well, thank you. Um, Don, I have a question for you. Are you able to see the chat box or not right now? Um, well, let me, um, I can, I uh, think I'll, let's see. Um, no. Okay, well, I'm just gonna read something that Mike McKeague put in there, um, that he went and checked his copy of Ross Chamber and Chambers, and he found a note that he had purchased his in July, 1994, and that his first visit to Iron Mountain was in June of 95. And he was on an NPSO field trip with William Bloom. And he hiked from the upper par parking lot to the summit and down. <laughs> great. So that was great. And you know what? Um, I have a question for you about how you get that lovely dark background. And I know that Mike McKee had explained it to us once upon a time, but I'd like you to explain uh, some of your techniques for blocking out the flowers. Oh, well, sure. Uh, all, all will be explained if you take my class. Uh, but um, there, there are actually several ways of, of doing it. Um, initially, I started out by trying to take uh, photographs of flowers that were in the sun with a dark background. And that um, in, in Photoshop, that's an easy way to do it. But um, I, I grew not to like the, the harsh light of sunlight on flowers. So it can be done um, several different ways. One is I always carry a uh, black cloth with me and um, that works uh, pretty well in most uh, situations. A lot of wildflowers are very small and there's no way to get a black background um, in it. And now I'm using a micro flash, a ring flash that attaches to my um, uh, my lens, and uh, because light falls off as the square of the distance, um, things that are in the background tend to be very dark. So sometimes it's a combination of things, um, but uh, I'll, you know, um, generally it's it's relatively easy to do in post processing. Everything that I Photograph is processed through Photoshop, but uh, just to uh, highlight the flower, there's uh, um, no uh, change of colors. If you have a calibrated monitor, chances are you're going to see exactly the same color as I saw when I photographed it. Amazing. Um, we also have someone who wants a clarification on how we sign up for your class. 
Okay, the best way is to send me um, an email to my uh, email address. I put you on my mailing list and um, I will let you know all the details. Um, another way is to go to the Oregon Society of Artists, OSA, and um, uh, get on their mailing list. Uh, incidentally, I first encountered Robert Ross at a, uh, a meeting of the um, Oregon, uh, the Portland Garden Club, mm. and um, which is which is actually located very uh, very near the Oregon Society of Artists, and he gave a a talk about Iron Mountain, and that's what inspired me to to take my first outing there. Also, I have his more extensive plant list than, uh, than the one that he has in his book. And again, if people would like to send me an email, I have it electronically and I'll be glad to send it to you. Um, again, the, the nomenclature is gonna be basically um, stuck in the time that he wrote it. So it's, it's a little out of date, but I think you can get there from, from here. You said you have a PDF version? It's either PDF or, or JPEG. I'm not, I don't recall. I'm, I'm hoping it's, it's PDF. Amazing. Um, so someone asks, uh, do you, Gina asks, do you have any plans for printing a wildflower book? Well, I have included uh, some wildflowers in uh, my first book uh, called Beauty of the West. And I've had a project of wildflowers of the gorge that's been sitting for uh, about seven or eight years. And eventually I will uh, get around to compiling it and, and publishing that one. And you're gonna bump Jolly out of the, the line, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no way. Uh, no, yeah. Um, I heard that, that his book is going to be updated for nomenclature, but um, I haven't heard anything in, in, in several years. So I don't know if that's really an ongoing project or not. Well, we just bought the last uh, box from the Oregon Historical Society. <laughs> so I guess unless we do it uh, as uh, in PSO PDX or someone takes that on, that's it's going to kind of stay where it is. Uh, I guess, uh, and again, some of the old timers can get in, in there, um, but we have a similar booklet that uh, NPSO started, and uh, we'd like to kind of see somebody take that on and resurrect it as well. Maybe with some of your new photos, yours and Paul's and uh, other people's. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have that question. I'm just trying to look. Just lots of thanks, um, certainly. I have a question. Um, uh, I think that it had been mentioned that you uh, have some of your photos in the Sierra, in, Sierra Club engagement calendar. And I was just curious uh, if you had shown any of those tonight. And I also wanted to highly suggest a couple of those sedum photos. Those were amazing. <laughs> well, um, I, I submit a lot of photographs to the Sierra Club and they choose which ones um, they, they would like. Um, and uh, they, they have a particular style. The, the two photographs that they printed were one from uh, Yellowstone and uh, one from uh, Baker Beach. And um, I'm wondering if I can find that one your from... thumbnails of it, huh? Yeah, let's see. Uh... No. 
Yeah. Okay, so this, this is the one that the Sierra Club is going to use in 2023. So those calendars actually are available now. And uh, this is, these sand formations are very, very old and they're more or less covered up by contemporary sand dunes. And when the winter storms uh, blow through the central Oregon coast, they remove the top layer of contemporary sand dunes. And so these can go back as far as the Pleistocene. So what we're, we're seeing is it's not sandstone, but it's compacted sand that's not visible most of the year, only when the right storm comes at the right time of the year. And I will stop my screen share and um, You're leaving us with that last photo. Yes. <laughs> that was wonderful. All of them were just amazing. And uh, I know that I appreciated like some of those small ones that, I mean, even with a hand lens, they're very awkward to see. And so by you taking those macro photos, you know, we're able to see the beauty that we normally just disregard. Yes, one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, kinds of flowers has a, a very scientific name. They're called uh, belly flowers because you have to get on your belly to really appreciate them. <laughs> I think we had another presenter. Oh, I'm blanking his name. Frank, help me out from Hawaii that also talked about belly flowers. Um, so Erica wanted a, a clarification about uh, where the class, again, the uh, photo class was going to be at. It looks like Mike McKeague looked it up, but you can confirm. Uh, the location is going to be somewhere near Mount Hood rather than near Iron Peak? Or Oh, yes. It's going to be um, uh, near uh, Umbrella Falls. 